Our next subject is the role of the clergy and the laity in implementing Catholic social teaching. I'm going to focus uh, mainly on the laity, and if there's any time uh, remaining, I will say a few things about the role of the clergy. The theology of the laity put forth by the Second Vatican Council, Canon Law, and Pope John Paul II is inspiring and challenging. The Code of Canon Law succinctly identifies the laity and explains their role in the Church. The Christian faithful are those who have been incorporated into Christ and the Church by baptism and therefore share in Christ's priestly, prophetic, and royal office. They have a duty to live a holy life, to promote the growth of the Church in holiness, and to work for the diffusion of the divine message of salvation throughout the world. In addition, sometimes the laity even have the right and the duty to alert the hierarchy about matters that pertain to the salvation of souls. Their second principal duty is to be a leaven, to leaven, be a leaven in the world by working for social justice and to assist the poor from their own resources. More generally stated, each layperson in accord with his or her condition is bound by special duty to imbue and perfect the order of temporal affairs with the spirit of the gospel. He or she thus gives witness to Christ in a special way in carrying out those affairs and in exercising secular duties. As part of their duty to pursue holiness and to perfect the temporal law, the married lady have duties toward their families. The married faithful are to work for the upholding, upbuilding rather, of the people of God through their marriage and their family. Christian parents are especially to care for the Christian education of their children according to the teaching handed on by the church. The latter is especially crucial for the pursuit of holiness and the perfection of the temporal order. Fulfilling the latter duty is, of course, an important way of acquiring holiness. Turning now to Vatican II's Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church, we find more detail about the role of the laity in the world. The most helpful text, perhaps, is the following. Quote, moreover, let the laity by their combined efforts remedy the customs and conditions of the world, if the mores therein are an inducement to sin, so that they may favor the practice of virtue rather than hinder it. End quote. The effect of this kind of work is to imbue culture and human activity with morality and to better prepare the field of the world for the seed of the word of God. In other words, the laity are to work for the amelioration of the mores in every area of political, social, and economic life. Where they are successful, people will more easily practice virtue in their everyday lives and more readily let their lives be transformed by the word of God. Otherwise stated, holiness is more easily attained in a good regime, in a regime with good social conditions. In his... Uh, Christi Fidelis Laici, uh, Pope John Paul II, talks about the renewal of the temporal order in a very concrete way so that most Catholics could understand what the Church is teaching lay people about their specific vocation. He says, charity towards one's neighbor through contemporary forms of the traditional spiritual and corporal works of mercy represent the most immediate ordinary and habitual ways that lead to the Christian animation of the temporal order, the specific duty of the lay faithful. Now this is much less complicated than figuring out to, uh, how to solve the malpractice insurance crisis, for example, or reforming the legal profession, or reestablishing the Catholic identity of Catholic universities, or applying just war principles to war with Iraq. And back in 1988, Pope John Paul II was already aware that the laity were running up against obstacles in fulfilling their mission. In Christi Fidelis Laici, the Pope specifically mentioned two enticing temptations for the laity. Quote, the temptation of being so strongly interested in church services and tasks that some fail to become actively engaged in their responsibilities in the professional, social, cultural, and political world and the temptation of legitimizing the unwarranted separation of faith from life, that is a separation of the gospel's acceptance from the actual living of the gospel in various situations of the world, end quote. Not many would disagree that vast numbers of the laity have succumbed to these temptations and now need to pray insistently for deliverance from this evil. 
Instead of helping the laity resist the first temptation, many pastors have been instructing and encouraging them to become active in some church ministry as the admired and privileged way of living out their Catholicism more fully. You must have all noticed that everything is, is a ministry these days. Now, homilists generally shy away from explaining how lay people can renew the temporal order. Instead, they explain how lay, lay people can get more involved in lay ministries. The story of this lay responsibility for being a leaven in the world has become a dim memory, and it's hardly known to young people today. With all the talk about the role of the laity in the church at the time of Vatican Council II, one might expect more progress in this area. There are, of course, examples of individuals and groups doing wonderful things. In a recent article on the laity, Mary Ann Glendon mentioned communion and liberation, the community of St. Egidio, Focolari, the neo-catechumenate way, Opus Dei, and Rainium Christi. Now, I constantly hear stories about lay individuals exercising a quiet influence throughout their lives. Nevertheless, one cannot help but notice that most lay Catholics are unaware of their opportunities to be a leaven in the world. Now, in the midst of the sexual abuse crisis in the Catholic Church, some of the laity want to ascend higher on the altar steps so that they might begin to share in the governance of the Catholic Church as a remedy for the failure of so many bishops to be true shepherds of the faithful. The newly constituted voice of the faithful has as its mission statement, quote, to provide a prayerful voice attentive to the spirit through which the faithful can actively participate in the governance and guidance of the Catholic Church, end quote. Especially noteworthy is that there is nothing in the mission statement about the role of the laity as a leaven of, in the world. The separation from, of faith from life is a temptation to which many have already succumbed on principle. One of America's premier theologians, Avery Cardinal Dulles, says that many Americans regard religion as a private matter. He writes, any effort by the church by a church to say what is morally permitted, required, or prohibited by the law of God in the spheres of politics, medicine, business, or family life is resented as an intrusion into alien territory. Anyone who sees religion as determinative for secular activities is likely to be regarded as a fanatic. Teachers, businessmen, politicians, or judges who let religion impinge in a major way on their professional activities are considered eccentric." End quote. Quotation. America's most insightful bioethicist, Leon Cass, has noted the paucity of theological reflection by theologians on bioethical issues. He says, most religious ethicists entering the public practice of ethics have their, leave their special religious insights at the door and talk about deontological versus consequentialist, autonomy versus paternalism, justice versus utility, just like everybody else. Cass also notes that the non-religious mainstream in the field regard theological insights as hopelessly parochial or sectarian. To be a player and to be taken seriously, religious ethicists conclude that they must limit themselves to the reigning philosophical language and concepts. Now, the causes of the separation of faith from life are several. The most obvious explanation for the phenomenon described by Dulles and Cass is the desire for acceptance and influence in the world of work. People in the business and professional worlds, including faculty at Catholic colleges, teachers and principals in Catholic schools and staff in diocesan offices, don't want to be regarded as sectarian or out of step with the way things are done. Uh, you know, I once heard uh, of a principal of a school uh, saying, a Catholic school, saying that uh, she didn't really think that she could ask the non-Catholics uh, working for the school to be respectful of the mission of that Catholic school. The question arises, why don't more Catholics resist the message that their faith is a private matter? My response looks at both internal and external factors. First, bishops, priests, catechetical leaders, and Catholic schools on the primary and secondary level have not done an adequate job of forming, informing the young in the basics of the faith. Being only partially instructed, most parents are not able to impart a thorough and rigorous formation in the faith. It is typical for Catholic college students not to know the meaning of such terms as incarnation, redemption, Pentecost, and virtue. Hardly any can recognize that there are petitions in the Lord's Prayer. 
With a poor formation in the faith, how could most Catholics recognize an improper separation of faith from life? Secondly, the instruction in formation in the faith at Catholic universities may succeed in a few institutions, but for the most part is weak or absent, or in some cases, uh, even detrimental. Third reason why people have trouble relating their faith to their work and other aspects of their daily lives is the difficulty of acquiring the kind of prudence uh, required to make the proper connections. Being a good person does not necessarily give someone the ability to make the kind of prudential decisions that will benefit his fellow citizens. And I recall our previous discussion of political prudence and how it's distinguished from ordinary prudence. You know, a few months ago, I attended a, a funeral of a well-known and beloved physician in Scranton, Pennsylvania, where I live. Uh, J. Robert Gabin uh, suddenly died at the age of 78, not having missed a day of work in 49 years because of illness. People stood in awe in the presence of this man's dedication to his patients. He still made house calls for the infirm, and it was not unusual to see him visiting patients in the hospital at 11 o'clock in the evening. As they say, prince or pauper received the same meticulous care from this Catholic physician. Now, I don't think he needed any more than ordinary prudence to live his life as he did. Good as this man was, he would not have been able to contribute to the solution of the malpractice insurance crisis in Pennsylvania without the kind of political prudence of which Aquinas speaks. Still, another reason for the separation between faith and life is the bad influence of lay Catholics in the limelight. Catholics have heard a steady drumbeat from Catholic politicians who say, I am personally opposed to X, but I will not impose my opinion on others, especially religious opinions. Marianne Glendon's comment about this subterfuge is enlightening. Quote, that slogan was the moral anesthesia that they offer to people who are troubled about moral decline, but do not know quite how to express their views, especially in public settings. It is a sinister doctrine that would silence only those moral viewpoints that are religiously based. But the anesthesia was very effective in silencing the witness of countless good men and women. And of course, the slogan was a bonanza for cowardly and unprincipled politicians." End quote. That many Catholics could not see the problems with the slogan is surely another sign that their theological and political education is deficient. Even Catholic leaders were not able to show right away the deficiencies of the slogan by means of a few persuasive clarifications. Only in recent years, Glendon argues, have some Catholics, Protestants, and Jews stepped forward to point out that when citizens in a democratic republic advance religiously grounded moral viewpoints in the public square, they are not imposing anything on anyone. They are proposing. This is what is so supposed to happen in our form of government. Citizens propose, they give reasons, they deliberate, they vote. Now, another reason why religiously granted viewpoints are discouraged in the public arena is the pervasive influence of political the liberal political theory in academia and in the media. Following in the footsteps of Locke, contemporary political theorists have tried to provide a theoretical justification for excluding religion from the public square. In political liberalism, John Rawls, for example, argues that there are neutral principles of justice on which everyone can and should agree. These indisputable principles of justice, he argues, can be determined without relying on any theological or philosophical views of the good about which there is and will always be reasonable pluralism. Once accepted, these so-called neutral principles of justice establish the parameters within which citizens are able are, are to make moral judgments about public matters. Just as there is an absolute separation between the affairs of the church and the commonwealth for Locke, so for Rawls, there is an absolute separation between justice and conceptions of the good, whether theological or philosophical. Michael Sandel's most serious objection to this political arrangement is cogent, quote, According to the ideal of public reason advanced by political liberalism, writes Sandel, citizens may not legitimately discuss fundamental political and constitutional questions with reference to their moral and religious ideals. But this is an unduly severe restriction that would impoverish political discourse 
and rule out important dimensions of public deliberation, end quote. Consider how Rawls's principles of justice work in practice with respect to abortion. Government neutrality on abortion would mean that the political values of toleration and women's equality would prevail and that any moral and religious conviction about the origin of life and the status of the embryo would be bracketed. That is to say, it would not be appropriate or permissible to argue against the legality of abortion on the basis of some comprehensive moral or religious viewpoint. So a neutral principle of justice would require the toleration of a woman's right to choose abortion and would not allow Catholic doctrine on abortion to be debated in the public arena. In the debate about abortion rights, explained Sandel, those who believe that the fetus is a person from the moment of conception and that abortion is therefore murder could not seek to persuade their fellow citizens of this view in open political debate, nor could they vote for a law that would restrict abortion on the basis of this moral or religious conviction, end quote. The bracketing or exclusion of these comprehensive views in the public arena would extend to all matters pertaining to justice and rights. Rawls argues that the ideal of public reason requires the exclusion of all comprehensive religious and moral views from the affairs of the commonwealth. Sandel explains, according to the ideal of public reason, political discourse should be conducted solely in terms of political values that all the citizens can be reasonably expected to accept. Because citizens of democratic societies do not share comprehensive moral and religious conceptions, public reason should not refer to such conceptions. So says Sandel. This very narrow understanding of public reason would keep the church out of the public square. Now John Paul II believes that re-evangelization is necessary to overcome the secularization of societies all over the world. But there is a precondition for this ecclesial work. To imbue societies with a Christian spirit, what is first needed is first to remake the Christian fabric of the ecclesial community itself present in these countries and nations. The problem is that Catholics are conforming to the spirit of the age. They are being evangelized by the culture. Clendon describes the crisis this way. But the fact is that far too many American Catholic theologians trained in non-denominational divinity schools have received little grounding in their own tradition. This is a point developed compellingly by Father Matthew Lamb of Boston College. Far too many religious education materials are infused with the anger and disappointments of former priests and sisters who went to work in religious publishing houses because their training suited them for little else. And far too many bishops and priests have ceased to preach the word of God in its unexpurgated fullness, including the teachings that are most difficult to follow in a hedonistic and material age. George Weigel has emphasized this point in The Courage to be Catholic. A moving literary presentation of this latter point, of this last point, is found in the justly famous Diary of a Country Priest, written by George Bernanos. The dean of Blangemont tells the young priest that the church is powerless to teach the Christian faithful among the petty bourgeoisie that they should moderate their greed for gain. Quote, they may be more or less amenable to our teachings as far as, for instance, the errors of the flesh are concerned. But what they call business appears to these industrious folk their special preserve, where hard work excuses everything, since to them work is a kind of religion. Each one for himself, that's their rule, and we are helpless. It will take years, centuries maybe, to enlighten their minds and rid them of the feeling that business is in the nature of war with all the rights and privileges of real war, end quote. If Berenos were writing in the United States today, he might very well have said through some priest that the church confesses an inability to address the personal autonomy of the faithful in matters pertaining to the culture of life and sexual ethics. At any rate, insofar as theologians, catechists, catechetical materials, bishops, and priests fail to do their job well, the laity will have a deficient formation and will be hindered accordingly in carrying out their mission in the church and in the world. So the first step in remaking the Christian fabric of the ecclesial community is to reestablish sound Catholic leadership in the areas mentioned above. From all appearances, this is going to quite, take quite some time in the United States. 
Not that there won't be individual bishops, priests, catechists, and theologians doing a wonderful job all over the country. Secondly, the various attempts to keep Catholic views out of the public square must be resisted in every way possible by those Catholics who understand that Catholicism is not and cannot be a private matter. Theoretical arguments and political action are both necessary. Thirdly, adequate formed laity may conceive of their mission as a leaven in the world in two ways, to up uproot evil and to go do good in a positive way. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings offers help in understanding the first aspect of this lay mission. In part three, Gandalf explains that evil will not disappear if the ring of power is destroyed and Sauron is defeated, but must be defeated over and over again in every generation. Listen to Gandalf's words. If the ring of power is destroyed, then he will fall, and his fall will be so low that none could foresee his arising ever again. And so a great evil this world will be removed. Other evils there are that may come, for Sauron is himself but a servant or emissary. Yet it is not our part to master all the tides of the world, but to do what is in us for the succor of those years wherein we are set, uprooting the evil in the fields that we know, so that those who lie after may have clean earth to till. What weather they shall have is not ours to rule, end quote. Tolkien's vision is both inspiring and an education in moderation and encourages people to realize that their success in uprooting evils will not only benefit themselves, but also future generations. For example, a ban on cloning. But Tolkien's story also teaches that the victory over evil is never definitive on this earth. You can't ban hatred and injustice as some social justice advocates naively hope. Bernos is of the same opinion. His uh, Cure de Torcy tells the younger country priest to give up his fixation about wiping out the devil. Then he adds, what the church needs is order. You've got to set things straight all the day long. You've got to restore order, knowing that disorder will get the upper hand the very next day, because such is the order of things. Unluckily, night is bound to turn the day's work upside down. Night belongs to the devil. So the curé de Torcy. The positive task of the laity is to practice the spiritual and corporal works of mercy and to use whatever political prudence they have to ameliorate the various communities in which they live. While the latter task is difficult and depends on favorable opportunities, and rare qualities of soul, the former can always be carried out in various ways. Now, in the few minutes that remain, I'd like to say something about the, the role of the clergy and the role of the bishops in promoting social justice. And there really seems to be uh, an argument about this, that some uh, believe that it is wholly proper uh, for the bishops to apply principles to particular cases and really to make partisan political statements. Now, they, are, they make those statements and tell the Catholic lady that they may freely uh, disagree with them. So in this perspective, the church participates uh, in political debates as one political actor among, among many. It sees itself then as a voluntary association proposing the, the, its views for consideration and possible acceptance. The Catholic Church, in this perspective, does not expect any favoritism from the state. It just wants freedom. Now, Cardinal Dulles has objected, you know, to this uh, position and said that it would be better if the bishops stuck to presentation of principles and didn't really get into partisan politics. And Dulles fears that the bishops unwittingly uh, give the impression that what is truly important in their eyes is not faith or holiness that leads to everlasting life, but rather the structuring of human society to make the world more habitable. Uh, now, if Father Brian Hare has responded to Cardinal Dulles and objected to his position and made two points. He says, the principles offered without specification of where the principles lead in the complexity of public policy arguments can doom the principles to a marginal role, honored by all but seldom followed. And then he also argues, secondly, that the laity won't be attracted to 
social ministry unless bishops show that specific applications of principles are part of faith and holiness. Now, I would make these comments regarding uh, what Father Hare says. I mean, I, I think it's best if the bishops really focus on the presentation of doctrine and leave partisan politics to the laity. The bishops need to realize that, that uh, their own presentation of Catholic social teaching is incomplete and thus uh, misleading. The lady uh, further will have great difficulty distinguishing bishops' doctrinal statements from their advocacy of public policy with, with which they may reasonably disagree. I think the habit of disagreeing with bishops will nece necessarily carry over into the doctrinal area. Now, I think the bishops are in solid ground when they are, are denouncing evils, and it's much easier for them uh, to do that. And uh, I think that is not the same as trying to come up with a, a solution to some complicated uh, problem. Perhaps, but perhaps there is a way of directing attention of policymakers and citizens to the relative to, re to the relevant issues when they d discuss a, a particular public policy, and maybe they could do that, you know, without uh, delving into partisan politics. But it, certainly, it'll be uh, a disaster if Catholics um, uh, continue uh, to feel free you know, to disagree with their bishops when the latter are proposing uh, doctrines uh, to believe. So I think that Dulles' uh, comments really have to be taken uh, more seriously. Thank you very much.